tonight is going to be focused on how do we use the sim for real life and how do we train for real life? The one thing I think that's really important to call out is sometimes we just want to hop on the sim for fun. And what I don't want is for this to turn into homework so that it feels like it's a mission every time you jump on the sim. I think we all have to be able to compartmentalize when I'm gonna use the sim for training and focus deeply on that. And then, hey, if you wanna go screw around and, with some friends and, and, and have fun with it, that's a whole different story. But for tonight, we're gonna to talk about how do we use sims to really train for our real life driving. As I said to everyone that sort of joined in early, I don't like lectures. I think they're boring as all hell. So I would love for you guys to feel free to interrupt us, to ask questions. Uh, and you can unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can use the chat feature as well. We'll also have a dedicated Q&A time at the end. But while we're going through it, and we'll have a really quick kind of talk through um, on how we leverage this, and then we can kind of dive into more. Because I think a lot of this is, uh, it depends on you and the drivers and a lot of that stuff. So, with that being said, what I'd like to start the evening off tonight is introduce everyone to Joe. And for a little bit of background, I wanted to bring Joe on this call because Spark is a partner of ours and they develop really fantastic simulators. And they brought me out to Connecticut uh, where their facility is late last year. And I said, I was always a skeptic and I drove their Sims and loved their Sims. And List, listening to, to, to Joe and how he talked about some stuff, there was one thing that really piqued my interest that I personally wanted to learn a little bit more about. And I thought, why not do it with all of you? And we're just going to take five, 10 minutes. And Joe, when, when we were sort of working together, uh, you talked about how you, um, I don't know what the right word is, but tune simulators. And I want to dig into what is that? Like, why, how do you do this? And the reason why I'm really interested in this, because the more realistic we make the sim, the more it, it's helping us to train in real life, right? So but I just asked you a pretty deep, deep question. <laughs> why don't you just take a minute just to introduce yourself, give everyone a quick background on yourself, and then let's let's dig into this a little bit more, and then we're going to get into the drill. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, of well, first off, I appreciate you calling me a nerd. That's the biggest compliment <laughs> I've I've had Did today. I, I call myself a nerd. <laughs> yeah, but in doing so, I, I kind of joined that party. And um, yeah, so interestingly, we started out in the entertainment side of sim um, driving because when we first opened our the sim side of our company, we uh, had an entertainment center where people would come and just have fun on the simulators. Uh, and then uh, near us is a circle track. And so we had some of the cir circle track drivers start coming over and they were way more serious than like our normal clientele. So what mm -hmm. we started doing is, I mean, they were spending um, more money than our normal people. So we were kind of curious about like, what is this like serious side of sim driving? And so um, <clears throat> I have a background in physics and engineering, uh, so I approached it from a physics standpoint. And like you were saying, what type of feedback do we want from the simulator? Uh, generally, we want things that are physics-based, physical-based, um, which means essentially removing, there's a lot of simulators that have like canned effects where like if you go over the rumble strip, it always vibrates at 50 hertz. And it's like, okay, that's fun, but what we're, what our company now really focuses on is creating something that is realistic, like you were saying, um, and provides information that is uh, based on the physics again. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's kind of, that's, that's the approach that we take. Got it. So, you know, I know that you guys have your own, you know, uh, simulators that have a broad range of price points. And, and with that, you're able to go through and really develop the the sort of the the motion the feeling that all of this type of stuff one of the things that you know not not everyone here uh maybe some people already have a sim or not everyone's in the position to spend you know 20 40 or whatever the, the k on a simulator <laughs> but i know that you had mentioned i know this isn't what you guys core do um but i'm really interested in this and you'd mentioned that um i think you did it for for a blaze customer or are doing it where they already had a sim and you were sort of tuning it to get it to be a little bit better. What does that actually look like? How are you doing that? What are you focused on? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So it depends on the software, of course. Uh, a lot of people in here in, have probably in terms used of like iRacing or R Factor. Yeah, exactly. So um, the sim that the sim software that we usually focus on is is R Factor Two, um, and the reason for that is because of the additional details that we can pull out of it. Mm -hmm. um, iRacing, like you're saying, on the fun side of things, is absolutely the best. Nothing will ever beat iRacing in terms of like that online competition is super fun to do. Um, mm -hmm. But they're very strict about what pieces of data we can get out of the simulator. Mm -hmm. So um, in R Factor, there's a lot of pieces of data that from the telemetry, like suspension, compression, uh, patch velocity of like the tires sliding on the on the track that we can take out and use it to let the driver know like, oh, OK, I'm understeering, I'm oversteering. Um, mm -hmm. And it helps you drive the sim like you would drive a real car instead of driving Got a sim it. like a sim. Because we don't want our goal as a company isn't to make like good sim drivers. It's to make yeah. good real drivers. Um, 100%. Yeah. So yeah. so so that's and it. Um, and I think that what we struggle with a lot is that a lot of people have experienced those uh, the fun simulators, even if they are like quote unquote high end DIY simulators. Uh, that are like that fun side without being like that realistic driving side. So we just try mm -hmm. and nudge, um, like mm -hmm. we've worked with a couple of your clients. Now we try and nudge mm -hmm. it more towards like that realistic side. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you right, like just to, to bluntly say it, the I racing tire model is a piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so on the R factor side of things, you, you know, that maybe the base model isn't great, but you can tune it to be a little bit more realistic. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, and we yeah. will we build custom vehicles for people as well. Um, wow! So okay. uh, yeah, so we work with some developers that build custom vehicles that, and it takes it to the next step. So you know, we're, how long we're, does that take to to build a custom vehicle? A few months. Okay. Yeah, and okay, depending on like how unique the car is, depends. Mm -hmm. You know, it affects things like the cost and the time. Totally. So, you know, I want to, I, I want to, you know, obviously I, I've got a lot of interest on, on this tuning thing, but I definitely want to give you the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about more about on Spark. So my, my overall question would, would also kind of go to let you sort of go towards that end. It seems like from a product standpoint, where you really kind of specialize is hardware and then tuning the software to sort of work really well with the hardware that you're putting together right so from a hardware yeah. perspective what is the like we've all heard that like you know motion sims are the best thing in the world and, and i've quite frankly driven a ton of motion sims and i'm <laughs> like this is not that helpful sure it's a cool story that looks fun but from your point of view from the physics from the engineering point of view if you were to think about the hardware, what parts are the most important mm. parts of the puzzle to sort of get right? Yeah. So like for anyone that is just getting into sim racing, the the first thing I would do would be to get yourself a chassis. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of people race like with their wheel attached to a desk and <laughs> it, and and like I'm in a rolling chair right now, so imagine trying to press the brake pedal, and then all of a sudden I'm rolling into the wall behind me. So having like a, having a dedicated chassis is a, a huge step forward. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, then you have the pedals and the wheel and the shifter and you know the screens. Mm -hmm. And there's a million different things, but I would say making sure, like, if we're talking first step, would be to have like a dedicated sim chassis that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you sit in it, it has similar ergonomics to the car that you plan on driving um, and training for. We're, when, when we like install one, we're like really obsessive and measure everything, but <laughs> for, for at home. <laughs> Leave it, it to the engineer. <laughs> yeah, for at home, it's, it's, you know, a good first step just to have something that, you know, you sit in it similar to your car. Um, everything's in a similar position to your car because you are developing these motor skills that you want to take to the track and as little difference between your simulator motor skills and the track motor skills, the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So on the hardware, you know, before I met you and like, you know, went back in the day for, for so long, I used a Logitech G25 <laughs> yeah. or G27 steering wheel and like a, I don't even remember what the seat was, but it was chassis. The first upgrade that I did was really get the hydraulic uh, brake pedal yeah. versus just like pushing it down. <laughs> 
Is that sort of one of the, is that a, like, would you focus a lot on the pedals themselves or do you think that's a little like overrated and not necessary? <laughs> um, it's hard to say. I, I definitely okay. think that the brake pedal is where a lot of people struggle in simulators. Mm -hmm. um, and so we spend a lot of our time focusing on getting like the right, the right uh, like progressive increase in resistance in the brake pedals with, with different types of like bushings and springs and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. and like you were saying, like a load cell pedal, which I think is what you're talking about. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no yeah. worries. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, it makes a, it, it does make a big difference over something okay. that's like a spring and it's like, okay. how far am I pressing it? And then, um, with like integration into something more serious, like our motion simulator, we can dial in like how much, you know, front end dive do you have under braking, mm -hmm. which can help with like comprehending how much you're actually slowing down, mm -hmm. which a lot of people press the brake and they're like, this is where I braked last lap. So I'm probably okay. Instead of yeah. actually understanding like how much the, the car is actually decelerating. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, we're, and we're going to transition here over to talking about the driving side and give everyone some drills to work on here. But I think um, what, what, what I really liked about working with you all and, and kind of the, the theme here is the, the tuning, right? The, hey, this is what I'm feeling. This is what's different than real life. And then you'd be able yeah. to take the time to like really fine tune it. Uh, and you could do that when, you know, you're at the, your office and doing it or, you know, you come in to install it, you guys leave you could do it remotely as well, right? And, and sort of yeah, get yeah. this thing right. So I think that's the sort of uh, super unique, something I've never heard of before. And, and like you said, it, it it gives you that extra feel. And the more senses you touch on, the more impactful the training is at the end of the day, right? Uh, yeah. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to transition the conversation, but Joe, you're able to stay on until the end, right? Like 30, another 30, 45 minutes or so. Or yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll be here to answer any questions at the awesome. end. Um, awesome. Yeah. And what, one last thing that I forgot to mention that I think is, is valuable is the tuning of the actual car within the software um, mm. often gets overlooked, but I'll leave it at that. And I'll, I'll let you, yeah. <laughs> you awesome. go on. I'll be no, here I for, for the that. end. Yeah, I appreciate sure. we, we can have a we can have a two hour conversation to get into this because I'm learning a Easy. lot from you Easy. on that. Um, so what we're going to do just for everyone, uh, we're going to have Joe and, and Matt as well from Spark. They're going to stay at the end. So if we want to talk or have more questions about the hardware, the 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 what how things come together, purchasing sims, improving sims, all that type of stuff, they're here for that. I'm going to go ahead and transition in to talking about the driving part of things. So the first part of this, one thing that I'm really excited to, to sort of announce for all, all of our members uh, as they're coming soon is we're gonna be releasing training drills. And as part of this presentation, I'm gonna give you all five specific drills that you can be doing and practicing that directly relate to real life driving. And all of this will be in the app. So how are Blaze training drills going to work? Well. Number one, I got to move my hat out of the way so I can kind of go through all of this, is all of our drills are assigned by your dedicated Blaze coach. So when I'm watching your video, real life video, and we're talking about what you can improve, the next thing that you're going to start to get is a weekly training program made by your coach that hits on the points that they were talking about in their coaching session. And you're going to get things like hand-eye coordination drills, vision training drills, sim racing drills, mental training drills, um, a whole bunch of different drills. And it's going to be on a weekly basis. And you're going to get a video example of the drill, descriptions of the drill. You're also going to get sets and reps and rest time for the drills as well so that you can log into the app, take a look. This is what my coach wants me to do this week. You can edit anything. So if you're like, Dion, you're crazy. I'm not going to do this drill. You can just delete it. You can edit it. If I say, hey, I want you doing four reps in 12 minutes, you're like, I only got three sets this week. It's meant to be flexible to, to sort of fit your what you're working on, what's your style. And this is one of the things that we're partnering with Spark to, to sort of do and film is all the sim racing part of this. And where they're going to be helping us to eventually develop some very specific drills as well. Uh, and then with this, your coach is going to help keep up to date with what your training progress is, help edit the plan, help continue to work so that during the off season, in between race weekends, we're continuing to build. Um, so we're really excited about this. It's probably going to be coming out sometime in early July, and we're already testing this with a few drivers internally. So what are five specific drills that we can start doing today 
they'll help us in our real life driving. Now, when I look at this, the sim as a tool, I think it's very good at certain things and not so good at other things. So at a high level, I personally don't think it really matters what car you're picking to, to use for your simulator driving. I tell drivers, pick a car that you can do more than three laps without spinning or crashing. I struggle with that in some cars. Like if I try to go get a Formula One car and just, you know, like put around, I'm, I'm crashing every second lap. So that's not very helpful. But if let's say you drive, a, I'm going to make this up. Like I drive an Audi R8 GT3 car for most of my career. iRacing has that. I didn't necessarily need to drive that. I could drive anything that's in the ballpark. And also for a lot of these drills, what track you pick doesn't really matter as well. Sure, picking a track that you know a little bit better can help for parts of it, but sometimes forcing yourself to get out of your comfort zone and driving a different track will really matter. The second thing here is really in terms of lap times in the sim racing world, I only look at me versus me. I completely throw away what the top sim racing drivers are doing. I, for the most part, completely throw away the lap times I'm running in real life as well. Because at the end of the day, it's not perfect, right? They're sim racing. If I'm trying to go be the fastest sim racer in the world, it rewards certain bad habits that don't work in real life. Uh, a lot of things and a lot of the drivers I work with are tired of me yammering about initial throttle application points and them coming too early. The sim rewards too early of initial throttle application point. The physics don't uh, adjust weight transfer correctly and you can get away with it, which doesn't work in real life. So we're going to talk about some drills that have relation to lap time. All I'm focused on is me versus me on the sim. I don't care as much about real life. I might use it as a ballpark. You know, as, am I 20 seconds off what I'll be doing in real life? Okay, that's maybe a bit dramatic. I don't know why Siri keeps talking to me today. Uh, but if I'm within two or three seconds, you know, you're within the sort of ballpark. So let's get into this. Drill number one. And this is probably the drill that I would recommend the most is the get up to speed faster drill. In my experience, and again, this is super generalized. This isn't everyone on this call. In fact, maybe it's the minority. Maybe nobody on this call struggles with this. But in my experience, especially in grassroots racing, the average driver takes far too long in the, into the weekend before they're comfortable and really starting to come up to speed. So let's say we have a, you know, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday weekend. Maybe on Friday, it's three practices. Saturday is another practice qualifying race and then pra practice qualifying race on Sunday. And, and, and again, if you're not a wheel to wheel racer, if you're a time trial driver, if you're an HPDE driver, um, this swap my races with sessions. Um, it sort of all applies to be the same. It takes the, uh, uh, often a driver, you know, multiple sessions before they're comfortable, before they're really pushing, before their eyes are working, before they're mentally in it. And it's a waste because it takes us so long. So, how do we get ourselves to hit the ground running faster? How many of you have set, like, on an average weekend, set your fastest lap on the last session or in the last race of the weekend? Uh, just send me a chat message if that sounds familiar. I've definitely done that plenty of times, right? So imagine if we could have started where we ended, right? If we could have come up to speed that much faster. So how do we do that? It's almost all mental. And so using the uh, using your sim, here's what I'd love for you to do. And this would be, you could do this on a, uh, a daily basis. You could do this once a week. You could do this every other day. Uh, I wouldn't worry about overloading yourself on this um, in terms of how many times a week you do it. You could definitely overlay, overload yourself on a daily basis. So it starts like this. You do one set, and a set includes a five-lap run. And you can go and do low fuel load. You can set up your car however you want. I kind of just leave it because it doesn't really matter. And I do one set and a set's five lap run. And then at the end of that run, I get out of the sim. I walk around. I take a break. It could be two to really two to 10 minutes. You can take a longer break if you want. I get back in the sim and then I do another five lap run. I get out. I take a break calm down, get back in the sim and go. And what we're trying to do here, the absolute goal is I want your fastest lap, your fastest lap to come set one, lap two. 
you want to hit the ground running and go. And you're not, what we don't want to do is just hop in the sim and go. We want to use this as an opportunity to train our pre-race mental routine. Now, maybe some of you don't have one yet. If you don't have one yet, I would highly recommend you start to get one. And that's a whole other discussion on the mental training side of things. But you know, for me, I have a, a, like a three minute routine that I run through myself every time I get in the car, every practice, every qualifying, every race. It's square, it's, you know, two to three minutes of square breathing. As I'm putting my helmet on, I have the, the thing I tell myself in the moment on the task at hand to the exclusion of everything else, put my helmet on, square breathe for a minute. I'm not visualizing anymore. I'm just putting myself in that zone. I want to do that before every set. So when I'm starting to starting off, maybe I'll go warm up. I'll do some jump rope. I'll stretch out a little bit. I'll put myself in the zone. Okay, step one, how fast can I go right out of the gate? Take a break, relax, come back in, restart my pre-race routine, that mental two to three minutes, go. And you're getting reps in on your pre-race routine on finding the zone, and you're getting reps in on that intensity. So building on this, as race car drivers, we have really two mental states that work together, that layer together, that there's also a little bit of conflict. So this is working on what we call mental intensity, which is our ability, sort of that one lap, pure speed. How do I access that intensity? Now, if we're doing uh, a 30 minute race, a 20 minute session, how do we sustain? that higher level of focus for a longer period of time. And if you want to take this to, a, to another level, and I haven't written about this here, but if you really want to take this to another level, I would wear a heart rate monitor during this. And I would measure how low can I keep my heart rate with, how, with keeping my intensity as high as possible. And the reason why I think this is so important, and, and this was – a big thing in my career, I had the opportunity to play, go to this place called Formula Medicine. And it's a, it's an, a via ratio Italy. I went with Ricky Taylor and Jordan Taylor. We're kind of competitors, but friends. And this place trains most of the Formula One grid, most of the DTM grid. So we go there is, you know, you know if most of you, if you've already heard this story, I apologize. You're going to hear it again. Um, but I think it's really valuable to understand the, the, why I think it's so important. So we go there and we arrive in Italy the next morning, 9 a.m. First thing in, they put us in their sim racing room. So we're all in the you know, nice, relaxed sim racing rigs. But we're not doing sim racing. They give us two little controllers. There's just, just like two you know, little I don't know, sticks with a button on top and one in each hand. And they run us through this like six-part mental test. The first one was like a pure reaction time test. The next test, like it would show you the color. It would say the word red, but it would be written in blue, and it was true, false, and it'd be accurate and fast. There was some visual training drills as well. And it was just how accurate and how fast can you get through this? So, you know, we're all sitting next to each other, you know, all 19 year old kids and we're, you know, tense and like trying to kick each other's ass and going for it. And so they, we go through this thing and we're done. It's like a five minute test. We're all, you know, laying down air conditioned in the morning. They come back in and they're like, okay, so here is top of the list. And I want to say it was like, I don't remember who it was Martin Tomchik or somebody like that, some deep TTM driver that was, you know, everyone was looking up to. And it was like, okay, and here you guys, the bottom of the list. And on top of that, do you guys know what your average heart rate was? And of course, I, don't, I have no clue. Like my resting heart rate is, you know, high 40s, low 50s. So how high could it be? It was 142 beats per minute. Sitting down, relaxed. Why? Because we were pushing, right? You're, you're, you're trying to, go come on go 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 and their whole their whole philosophy of of sort of teaching the mental side of the sport is this concept of mental intensity and mental endurance and what the best race car drivers in the world can do at a, at a ridiculously high level the michael schumachers the max verstappens they're all of these they can access that super intense rate in a more relaxed way that doesn't tax the body that lets them sustain that level of focus for a longer period of time. They can sustain a higher level of intensity with their mental endurance, right? At 147 beats per minute, I am taxing my body, right? And as my body breaks down, my mind breaks down, and I can't sustain that level of focus for a long period of time. So their whole thing is how do you sustain high levels of focus 
while being relaxed. And a heart rate is a great indication of how relaxed you are. So if you wanna take all of this to the next level, having that heart rate monitor and trying to do this all with keeping your heart rate low and trying to find the right balance, right? If you do it too much, you're, you're not intense enough, you're too relaxed, you're not going fast enough. But if you go overdo it, your heart rate skyrockets. This is something to think about a little bit there. So that leads me to drill number two, which is almost the exact opposite of drill number one. Drill number two is building mental endurance. So this is a one set a day drill, and I would start with a 30 minute run. So I'd pick one car, one track, get that fuel load up so that you can go through 30 minutes straight. And the whole goal is to have every one of your laps within a half a second. Now, if you're pushing too hard, there's no freaking way you're gonna be able to do that, especially on a sim. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a terrible sim driver. Like the thing is so much harder to drive than in real life. I spin every fourth lap. So you have to you have to train yourself to drive slower. But that's not what matters, really. I don't really care about lap time. All I'm doing is saying, okay, let me go run 30 minutes, all my laps within half a second. If I can achieve that, I can make the drill harder in one of two ways. I can make the drill longer. And this is where it depends a little bit on what you're racing. If you never do a session longer than 30 minutes, um, then maybe going longer on the session is, is not the best path forward. It isn't a negative. Um, so if your longest session is 30 minutes and you want to do a 60-minute run on the sim, that'll only help you more in real life. But I would say for the, the people that do shorter distances, I would say the best next approach is saying, okay, now let me up the bar a little bit. Let's say I was doing, let's say I qualify, I can qualify and do a 135.0, but I can only do a 140.0 with all my laps within a half a second. Once I've achieved that, maybe I'm going to try a 139.5, maybe a 139.2. I make the lap times a little bit harder. I have to push a little bit harder, which stresses my mind a little bit more and might cause more mistakes. But my whole goal is one set start with 30 minutes and then you can you can do both or you could go one of two ways you can extend that up to 45 minutes to be honest with you even with someone like I would do three hour stints on i racing I never really did much more than 45 to 60 minutes because it's just more mentally exhausting um and I would just up my lap time and oftentimes what I would do here is I would do one day of qualifying sort of performance the next day of endurance so like before Sebring the week or two before the Sebring 12 hour it was sort of hey every other day I'm trying to qualify and getting that intensity up and then in between that I would do 30 to 45 minute runs and that way I can also look at what's my qualifying lap times and then how quickly can I get my endurance lap times up to be as close as possible right if I the, the more intense I can sustain for a longer period of time, the less gap I've got between those qualifying runs and those race runs, which is how it all ties together here. Again, work on that pre-race routine. Every time you drive the sim for a training purpose, try to put yourself in the state of mind that you would be wanting to do in real life as well, okay? So moving to uh, drill number three, the brake release focus. Um, so this is where our drills start to get a little bit strange. Drills don't always have to be about um, how fast can I go for how long. We can experiment with different things that we're going to be working on in real life. And this is type of stuff that, by the way, a lot of these drills we can also do in real life. Now, a lot of times we don't want to have to do dr drills in real life. We got race weekends and not much practice. So what is the break release focus? I would say you want to do three sets. And each set, we have a slightly different break release area, break release zone. And, and what we're really doing here is training our, our mind, training our body to feel the end of break zone reference point and to get an idea for A, just feeling it, B, knowing what happens when we move it. So set one, I'm going to tell myself my break release, I have to be off the brakes at turn in at every corner. Set two, I'm going to have my brake release, the last little bit of brake pressure, can only come off after the apex point, way later. Set three, it's going to be right in the middle, sometime just before the turning point and the apex point. Now, this sounds like it's probably nuts. You're like, what the heck are we doing here, right? But what we're, what we're really doing is training our ability to figure out 
how, how quickly can I drive the car when I change these points? What does the car do differently when I change these points? And training our mind to have the focus and our foot to have the dexterity necessary to be able to do this. If I have, if I have to carry my brakes past the apex point in every corner, the only way for me to do that and sustain some level of competitiveness to drive as quickly as possible is I have to be able to sustain and hold that as light as brake pressure as I can as I, as I can possibly do. So we're training our foot to do different things. We're training our mind to be able to feel that, and we're starting to understand what happens when we have different different parts. And a key thing that I do as a race car driver is I know my reference points. My reference points really are where I get back to full throttle, my apex point, my slow point in the corner where my initial throttle is, my end of brake zone, my, my turn in point, my initial brake zone. We have lots of reference points that maybe we don't even realize. This is one of those, and this is a great drill for us to start to focus more on that and understanding what the dynamic of the car does with this and how do I adjust my driving when this changes. So it's more of a knowledge-based drill than anything else. Now, the one thing with this is, and with all the drills, we have to make sure we sustain a good technique. So if the first set, the brake release comes at the turning point, that does not mean I'm right back to throttle. It means I'm off the brakes and I'm coasting until my normal initial throttle application point. And then I get to throttle. And a lot of this show will also start to calm things down for us and really make it crystal clear where I should be focusing. Now, there's parts of this that purposely break technique, right? If I'm having to break all the way past the apex point, obviously I'm going to be later to throttle, but I think we can all understand in that one instance, we're doing it on purpose. The other ones we want to have sustained good technique. Step three is kind of about putting it all back together, figuring out the right end of break zone, the right initial throttle application. You'll probably go a little bit faster. Okay. Number four, too much entry speed. So I get asked a lot, do I have to crash or spin to find the limit? No, you do not. But do you have to go over the limit to find it? Yeah, a little bit. But going over the limit doesn't mean crashing or spinning. You can go over the limit and, shit, I missed that apex by a little bit. Or ah, I was just a little bit too late back to full throttle. So this drill here is purposely focused on picking one corner and building up to the point little by little by little to where you're rolling too much entry speed. Now, that doesn't mean I want you flying off the edge of the road. It's I want you to purposely roll too much speed while keeping the car on the racetrack. And it's sort of up to you because it depends on the corner on how you roll at too much speed. You can experiment with braking later. What you're going to find is that's where flying off the side of the road um, becomes much easier to do, which is why when I coach, late braking is the very last thing we focus on. What you're going to find is that there's two better ways to be able to slowly work up to too much speed without going all, all over, without going off the road, and that is an earlier brake release or just a lighter amount of brake pressure overall. So this whole drill is you pick one corner, and I might say, um, hopefully, I, I, not everyone's driven every race track, but I'm going to say, I think a lot of us are driven VIR. Uh, I think at VIR, turn four is one of those really interesting corners where a lot of drivers actually over slow. Uh, and again, there's, there's exceptions to the rules and all of that type of stuff, so just generalize with me a little bit. Um, for most cars, it's an entry speed corner because you have to lift a little bit for 4A. Um, so this is a great corner to experiment with maybe braking a little bit lighter coming off the brakes a little bit earlier so that the mistake is i'm not off the road at corner exit the mistake is i can't get back to throttle until i'm mid straight or i'm i'm two car lengths past the apex point or i missed the apex point by a little bit it's those small mistakes that we're experimenting with and that should translate over the real life so the last drill I've got for you today, I think it's the last drill. Yeah, I'm at five. I can't count all of this. Um, is the reference point call out. And this one is pretty exhausting. And essentially, it's three sets of only five laps. And your whole goal is around the lap 
and every corner, you're audibly saying the next reference point you're looking at. So if we're talking about VIR, and let's say like I've got to happen to have this image here of turn three at VIR, right now, I'm still looking at the apex point for VIR. And I know my apex point, my minimum speed point is the start of that green and yellow curving. So right now I'd be saying green and uh, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna say start of the green and yellow curving is too many words, but I'll be saying green and yellow curve, green and yellow curve. And then as I get to it, I transition my eyes up to exit point. I'm gonna start saying, you know, exit point, exit point, exit point, I'm out there. Now the next one is turn four is sort of where the grass meets the road a little bit. I'm saying grass, 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 grass. And then I'm saying turn and turn it. You're just consistently talking from one reference point to the next. And what this is forcing us to do, it's forcing us to focus on the right things. So we've all heard, you know, uh, I don't know, some driver just wins some big race and he had a ton of pressure behind them. And they interview the driver and it's like, you know, how did you do it? And they're just like, I just hit my points. What that actually means is they are just focused at one reference point to the next. And focus, our mental focus, is almost directly, it's it heavily influenced by where our eyes are looking. So if you're losing focus in the car, the first thing I think about is what are my eyes doing? Where are my eyes looking? Are they lost? If I'm if I feel like I'm out of rhythm in a specific corner, the first thing I'm thinking about is, am I missing a reference point? Because my eyes don't know where to look or if they're lost in a certain area, it's almost definitely down to this. And what this is going to, it's going to immediately start to show you is if you're missing a reference point in a corner, if you, you're you going to know it right away. And you're like, well, shit, I don't even know what I should be looking at here because I can't say it. And that's when I would go and study the corner, look what pros are doing, ask your blaze coach, and then kind of work with them from there. So this one's exhausting. But it's a great drill, and it keeps you deeply focused in the moment. So I do three sets of five laps. You could always add an extra set to it or an extra lap or two to it as well. Um, but the whole thing as well, like we talked about earlier, it's going to get really easy for you to start to talk faster, to start to get more intense. Remember, calm, relaxed. You know, uh, green and yellow curve, green and yellow curve, exit curve, exit curve, grass, 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 turn in apex, apex, apex. Just talking through it nice and relaxed, but not to the point where you're driving slow. You should still be pretty intense about it as well. All righty. So, uh, again, for all of our members, we've got this coming soon. In the app, we'll have videos of this. You're going to get sets and reps. So you're going to talk about what the drills are. We're going to build this up. It's not going to be just sim racing. You'll have some real-life stuff, some actually really cool vision training stuff that we're working with a few different doctors on um, to work towards. It'll be peripheral, depth perception, all this type of stuff. You'll have some hand-eye coordination things as well, and then you can go and build it. And if you, if you don't work with a place coach, Parts of this will be totally free as well. You'll be able to see our library. You're going to have a drill of the week that'll be in our newsletters. And then you can go through and build your own training plan on a week over week basis. So I know there's a lot of information there. Uh, I would love to just open the door up for a kind of a Q&A session here. Um, so and, and with Robert, you're just going to go ahead and kick things off here. And I love that. Uh, Robert was asking, you know, shoes for the sim running versus racing shoes doesn't matter. Um, to be honest with you, I know that you saw in that one image, I was wearing shoes. I actually don't wear shoes typically when I'm on a sim. I'll go socks or sockless barefoot. Um, I've never worn racing shoes while I've been on a sim, to be honest with you, but I like barefoot. Um, Joe, what are, you, what are your thoughts on shoes versus no shoes? Uh, I am strongly against wearing like thick sole shoes like mm -hmm. like a, a running shoe um I, again coming back to like the break point or the brake pressure is so hard to feel um yeah because you're relying a lot on the pressure that you feel through the sole of your foot um if you have like we have haptics in our in our systems so mm -hmm. you can feel as the haptic increases in intensity you can feel uh either like brake slip or lock up and things like that um mm -hmm. but without the haptics i would say i would definitely not wear anything with thick soles for sure and to be honest with you you know if, if we're using the sim to work for real life um i'm going to sort of contradict myself a little bit here i wouldn't do anything that i wouldn't be doing in the real race car now obviously in the real race car i'm not going to be driving barefoot um so i contradict myself there a little bit uh, but i think everyone kind of gets the point smaller the sole the better the feel uh the better off you're going to be ultimately is what how i would read into what you said right um yeah for sure so Rob, uh, I was curious about your opinions on a set of Corsa as well. I've literally never used it, so I have no opinion here. Uh, Joe uh, or Matt, what are your thoughts on a set of Corsa? Uh, so we can kill two birds with one stone because Eric uh, asked earlier awesome. about 
Assetto Corsa, which I think he might've meant Assetto Corsa one versus Assetto Corsa Competition. Um, uh, for Assetto Corsa first, it's very easy to make um, what are called mods, which iRacing people won't have ever used mods because they don't allow it. But in Assetto Corsa, they do allow mods. Um, and so you just have to be careful not to end up with low quality mods because they are easy to make. Um, so for example, R factor two, which is what we use, it's really difficult to make a new car, which means that the people that are building them are putting in a lot of time and research into them before they can even like have something that works on track, uh, for ACC, it has super high quality content, which is cool. Um, but it's, it's very restricted in terms of like the tracks that are available, um, because that actually is similar to iRacing doesn't allow any mods. Uh, so great driving experience, but if you're trying to train like us tracks, there's not too many in there. Um, interesting. So, yeah. Interesting. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Does everyone else have any questions that we can run through? Feel free to, if you want unmute yourself or you can use the chat as well. Um, you know, whether it's for, for Joe and spark or for me in the driving side of things, hopefully tonight's been helpful overall. Uh, while we, uh, let me just pause for a second here. Oh yeah. Um, talk about using data from the SIM. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that I could take that question. Um, while I talk about this, feel free to, to sort of add to it. Data from the SIM is great. Um, in fact, I end up working with, so a lot of the drivers that I coach, obviously we're more focused on in-person stuff. But if I have a driver that uses a SIM, I almost always want to at least see one to two videos a year of their driving off the SIM. And that could include data. Um, because if we can use it the right way, if we're avoiding the bad habits and we're very conscious about our inputs, we have to be very conscious about our inputs. You can work and you can practice things like brake release, initial throttle application points, um, turn in rates, um, where you get out to exit points. So I think when we're, hey, I want to use the sim to train for this track and I want to go and run a fast lap. What I recommend is, okay, send me your video, send me your data. And what I'm doing for you is number one, making sure that you're avoiding anything that actually doesn't work in real life. And, and as an example of this, literally this last weekend, I'm working with a driver um, that uh, drives a Formula Ford on the West Coast. So it goes to Laguna Seca. The driver knows Laguna Seca, right? And at turn 11, for everyone that knows Laguna Seca, they have these massive hot dog curbs that there's no way in hell you're touching in real life. But on the sim, what was the driver doing? All over the top of it because the sim had allowed it and it's those little things that, you know, I, you know, and I, I say I, but I mean coaches as a general, when I say that, A, just build the discipline in it. But also if you're trying to use the sim to train or to learn a new track, and one of the things I always love that, you know, Matt and Joe say is most sims are just uh, track familiarization tools overall, right? Uh, and I will, the one thing I'll typically do is to tip my, my, my cap over to iRacing on the quality of their racetracks, I find are, are typically good, but they're not perfect. And because the physics are off, you can, when you're trying to learn a new track, when you don't realize certain nuances that don't work in real life, could work in iRacing, you can form these little bit of bad habits. So often drivers that are using sims to practice in real life, I don't start with the sim. The first thing I start with is real life YouTube or our curated onboard videos. Find a driver that's quality. If I can find it as close as possible to the car I know, but to be honest with you, it doesn't matter as much as long as you're not like, let me go watch a Formula One car because it's just a different thing. Or, uh, But as, as close as possible. And I'm looking for the nuances, the, the reference points, their, their brake pressure, their brake zones, their initial throttle application. And a great exercise is to almost, when I'm on iRacing, I want to find what's wrong on iRacing. What's wrong with this racetrack? Because if you can find what's wrong with it, you're looking at a deeper layer of that racetrack and that patch is missing. Those curbs are a different color. And that just is sort of correlated more to the real life side of things. So I think you can, I think you can actually go too quickly to the sim sometimes when it comes to a track you don't know. Um, so anyway, probably too much. I don't even know if I answered the question of the day, but yes, love using the data. But I would you know, use data and video, send it to a coach or review yourself and make sure you're using it the correct way overall. Um, 
Robert is asking on VR versus triple screens. Um, he likes the depth perception from VR better. I've heard that a lot. I've literally never used VR before. I was watching Apple's announcement last night on those really cool spatial computing stuff. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, Joe or Matt, you guys probably know this better than I do. What are your thoughts overall on VR versus triple screens? I'll take this one, Dion. And again, thank you so much for having us on here. This is a blast. So yeah. we have extensive experience with both. Back when we were an entertainment center, like Joe mentioned, we were strictly running full motion simulators with VR headsets. And so one, there were a lot of kinks to work out at the time because we're now talking uh, almost six years ago when that was the case. So there is no better experience than racing inside of a VR headset because of what Robert says. It's depth perception, it's immediately 3D. You are looking down the track. And if you need to check your mirrors because you're in an online race, you physically turn your head. It is, it is a very intuitive feeling. There are a couple drawbacks to VR and it's part of the reason that we don't offer VR anymore. We've gone strictly to 55 inch screens. And it's because one, the occurrence of motion sickness occurs a lot more in VR than it does on screens. And two, the user experience is challenging. So what we focus on is a simplified user experience that allows someone to use the simulator without needing to be an engineer like Joe is and understand all the inner workings and all the computer technicalities. The simulator should be easy to use. And when you use a VR headset, depending on which software you're using, there are certain menus that you can interact with inside the headset while you're wearing it. And then there are certain menus where you have to take the headset off grab your mouse because you still need a screen if you're using a VR headset and then interact with your mouse and keyboard with the screen rather than wearing the VR headset. And so for our clients that expect a much simpler experience, needing to know which menus to take the headset off and keep it on, it's a hard stop for them not wanting to deal with the challenges of that. So we simply go with triple 55 inch screens, which is massive. It really has some presence, but it also reaches past your ears and so then you, you are using your full peripheral vision, with, which helps with braking. It helps you look ahead to your apex. It just doesn't have the immersiveness and 3D of racing in VR. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Uh, and this is a really good one that I have no clue on from Keith is, does the force feedback on better wheels help feel that limit on the sim? I guess there would be kind of the, I would guess it's finding the right force feedback number. You can definitely have too much. Um, is there like a quality difference in force feedback at all? Uh, yeah, so there's definitely a quality difference between them. Um, what you can do with any wheel is just make sure that it's not what's known as clipping. So um, if, if you think about it sort of like in terms of like an audio system is kind of how the feedback works, where if the feedback that the wheel is getting is too intense for the wheel, you essentially aren't getting any information. So it's actually better to end up running your wheel a little bit weaker to make sure that you have all the information coming through and you're not clipping the force feedback. Um, <clears throat> on better wheels, kind of just like a speaker system, you're gonna get higher fidelity uh, sound or force feedback, and you'll be able to use a much higher strength so you won't need to reduce the force as much. Um, mm -hmm. So long story short, uh, it does help, but you can make some progress on a lower end wheel by, by reducing the force to make sure you're not clipping. This is, it kind of clipping sort of reminds me of, you know, a driver that's holding the wheel too tight. You're not getting the same level of sensory input, um, which again, I mean, I, we have so many different drills and that's kind of highlight another drill here, which is the sort of relaxed hands and then uh, an ab engagement at turning for every corner. So, you know, engagement doesn't mean flexing, but in real life, when you start to turn in, you want to engage your core. And while we're not moving and stuff like that in the sim, you can kind of train your body to get your mind or get train your mind to engage that core at turning. And that actually helps you feel the steering wheel better. Another thing you can practice is those light hands. So that was totally unrelated, but just kind of triggered, you know, other ideas in, in, in my mind here overall. Um, do you have any other questions overall? I hope this has been helpful. I'm, I'm really excited to get this thing out there in everyone's profile since you can start playing with it and, and training as well. Uh, before we hop off, any other questions? I, While we I, wait, can we'll I go ask for it, you, Joe. Can I ask you a question? Am no, I allowed? not at all. No, <laughs> <I'm out. laughs> go for it. Um, so this is actually, so when I'm like doing a lot of testing, I'll, I'll run way too many laps. Um, <laughs> but the one thing that I can never do 
is be consistent on my lap times when I'm not at like my absolute peak. Like if I'm running at like 90%, then my lap times are all over the place. But if I'm pushing as hard as I can, then they're consistent. Do you have any recommendations for like, if I want to drive at say 90% to like preserve tires? Yeah. So I mean, that's a really interesting one. Um, what, so sorry, my mind's going in 75 different directions here. Um, the first thing I would do is say, okay, we, we directionally know that this is a mental, something's happening with our mind here. Right. Um, and there's, there's something it I don't think there's maybe a, a lack of knowledge on a reference point because if you could drive at the limit when you're super focused you can hold consistency so it's not a lack of consistency at the limit and if there was that then there's a reference point problem so for me it honestly sounds like there's a sustaining focus problem um and when you're driving slower or trying to you know uh, you know, conserve tires. There's sort of two different things there, right? When I'm trying to conserve tires, I'm not driving slower. I'm more adjusting my driving style, which I'm still pushing like a mad madman, but in a slightly different way. That's slightly slower, but it's more more relaxed uh, for the tire. So, what I would say, hey, just let's separate those two things, and maybe they're we're doing it uh, sort of incorrectly. But my gut says they're. We, we're, we're missing a refocus trigger that you haven't realized you've lost focus early enough. And by the time you've realized you've lost focus, your lap times are sort of all over the place. So for me, I would start with what are we doing from a mental perspective um, off the racetrack? And this goes into a whole psychology lesson again that we can go hours on. But essentially, it's the uh, the building the awareness of negative me- mental chatter, which we all deal with. Uh, and a lot of the pr- problems we have is we don't realize it's happening. We don't realize you're saying, hey, you idiot, this, 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 and this, or work, or this and that. Um, and it could be happening for laps without us realizing. Um, the more that we can practice, and this is actually one of the best things about meditation, is a lot of people tell me, hey, I can't meditate because I can't stay focused on nothing, but the actual benefit of meditation is that skill of losing focus during meditation, realizing you're lost focus, and then refocusing. That is almost like a bench press for your mind, that whole process. The more that we can do it off the racetrack, the easier it becomes for us on the racetrack, and we can start to build in triggers and start to build an awareness for this. So that's where my mind goes. It's not 100% that that's not hundred percent accurate. Like what I would want to do with you is dig in a little bit deeper, ask more questions, but that's where my gut goes initially. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, just, totally. It, it just came across my mind. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. So this one I think is a great one for you, Joe, uh, pros and cons of emotion platform, uh, which is known as kind of one of the core things that you guys special specialize in, you know, something like the same gene and cornering is not possible to reproduce in a sim no matter what motion hardware you have. Um, So could it be bad to have inaccurate or false motion feedback in a sim? So lots of little, like lots to dig into there. I'd love to kind of get your perspective on that. Okay, so we'll keep this less than an hour, I promise. Um, (laughs) By the way, uh, while you're doing that, Matt, do you want to drop in your email address in the chat for everyone? So if everyone has follow-up, more detailed questions, they know how to reach out to you guys. Sorry, go for it, Joe. Yeah, so uh, can it be bad to have inaccurate uh, or false motion, 100%. Uh, most motion simulators I've driven on make you a worse driver. So uh, I completely think that there's huge cons to a, a motion platform that's that's not telling you the right stuff. Um, so <clears throat> um, I do all of the, the profile, like the motion profiles for our motion simulators. And uh, try to eliminate as many false cues and inverse cues that happen. So like if you've ever seen a motion simulator where you like press the gas and then you like lean back in your seat, um, that's a false cue because you should be accelerating forward and yet your body's going backwards. Um, so there's a bunch of little things like that that can essentially make the the motion platform like really confusing to your body. Um, so our, our motion is uh, extremely informative is how it's, it, it's not an entertainment motion 
profile. So you end up when you watch it from the outside, it doesn't look like you're moving very much because it's your, your body can sense small movements. You don't need to be like thrown all over the place. Like in, we always call them amusement park rides. We're not, we're not building amusement park rides and like the suspension on your car is on your track car is usually very stiff. So like, you shouldn't be like bobbing all over the place. Um, so yeah, sustained G forces. If, uh, if you're ever on a motion platform and they're trying to replicate sustained G forces, um, they should not be because it's impossible. Like you said, uh, unless so you're run and hide. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so unless your motion platform is the size of the racetrack, um, then you are not able to replicate the G forces from the racetrack. Uh, so yeah. So what we focus on is, is informational and, um, yeah. So be aware of, like you were saying, some bad or inaccurate, uh, motion for sure. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And so look, we're coming up at the hour here and, and if I'm right, you know, I think everyone can reach out to you if they have any questions. Um, even if they've got already got their hardware, it sounds like you guys can also help in sort of tuning that, getting a little bit better as much as possible. Um, and, and so everyone knows, like I'm typically totally against Sims for the most part. Most, most of them absolutely suck. Um, Joe and Matt do things right. Uh, they definitely care. And, and honestly, one of the best things that I've seen is just the, 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 the support that you guys give to your customers. You know, I think you, you genuinely care about people and I see that um, you kind of go out of your way and, 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 you know, make it easy to send in their videos to us and just use their Sims and make it a one, uh, you know, uh, you come in and install it. All you have to do is turn an on button on and make it nice and easy, which is awesome. So thank you guys for, for joining. Thanks for everyone else for joining tonight. Hopefully this is helpful. I'm also going to drop my email in the chat. Um, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I'm here. I, I hope this is helpful. Uh, also, if you go to our, like our website, any support email or little chat bubble, that also goes to me. I make it really easy to reach to, to get in contact. So if you've got questions, if we can do anything to help you, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. For all the Blaze members, keep your eye out over the next month or so. We hopefully release this in app and, uh, and any feedback that you guys have that we can make this better and better for you all. Uh, we're really excited about this. You know, coaching is more than just on the track or more than just technique it's the mental it's the physical it's the training so that's really what we're trying to build here and this is this, the second step towards that so thanks for everyone joining in made it, made it a fun night um hopefully you know what to go do on your sim next and best of luck yeah thanks all, right, all. see you Dan. thanks Dan. bye